Sue Parker here to tell us about oxytocin pathways to social monogamy and love. There was. Okay, I was very, I first want to thank the organizers and let me introduce it. Uh, this is a wonderful conference. I think we all agree and I should thank them in some way. I don't know what we could possibly do. Um, but they asked me to do an overview. Okay, and that's actually my favorite part of this work anyway, is trying to make sense of it. I started all sort of back up. I didn't mean to work on the monogamy. I'm not no against. I got sort of sucked into this. We weren't careful in the beginning about saying what we were doing because we thought monogamy was a sexual system, but in fact, it's a social system, as you all learned. And it took us 10 years to figure out that sexual and social monogamy were not the same thing. And I mean that empirical experiments that kind of got me crazy. Um, the paradox here is that we have a lot of interesting things going on, and they bring us around to how does, what is monogamy, how does it work? I also never really meant to study love. I was studying attachment. I was accused of studying love by the media. And that's a whole other story, <laughs> not a good story. Um, so we have a lot of pathways that you've beautifully shown. This is from a wonderful, wonderful conference. Um, many of them seem to point toward oxytocin. Um, monogamy, sex, love, whatever those are, can all exist in a continuum that no absolutes. Uh, natural variations are adaptive and they directly or indirectly support both survival and reproduction. Um, love itself, what it is, very hard to say. This poor little stoned out baby had just been born. It's my granddaughter, that's my son on the right, and the mother went through every known treatment, and that is part of the reason she managed to have the baby, probably almost died. Um, this is now 20 months ago. So I've been, I've spent my whole career trying to understand the things that are done to people and using animal models most of the time, prairie goals to understand that. Um, love as I'll define it is a complex of neurobiological processes that facilitate health, wellness, reproductive fitness, biological optimality. Of course, we, I think we all agree now that the mother-infant interaction in mammals is some kind of a prototype, a physiological prototype. Uh, social attachments are essential to all definitions of monogamy and love. The problem here is that most of the selective social bonds that humans are interested in only occur in a select subset of species. Um, they are not unique, however, luckily, to humans or other primates, and do occur in prairie folks. The term monogamy got us into problems right from the start. Uh, the common usage, the habit of having only one mate or marriage, mono meaning one, gallows mate. I asked my friend George Crucis, who's Greek, what does that really mean? He said it means a ceremony. I said, you mean it doesn't mean sex after all these years of arguing about what it was and wasn't? I said, no, no, it's a, it's a contract. But it's gone into well, marriage and current ways of looking at things, also a contract. Um, but it, because people got the two combined, especially starting with Deborah Kleinman's wonderful paper on monotony in mammals, it took a little while to untangle them, and that's really important to what we're doing, but it's also important to defining a species as monogamous or not. Uh, and this mixing of living systems and social systems still kind of dogs our, our existence. Um, social monogamy is the preferred term. We don't have any choice. I don't like have two words, but we pretty much have to. People have argued because of this confusion they argued about, maybe it's a myth. I won't go into this. David Barish has done a nice job of um, kind of demystifying it, just arguing it doesn't exist. But it does exist. It's a syndrome, actually. 
monogamy as a social system is a syndrome and it's been forged by evolution, genetics, development, and epigenetics. So we have a very interesting, flexible, adaptive system, which is one of the things I think that's most interesting about this system. It's it's designed to be tuned. Okay? Okay. So it's a social system and it appears based on what we know, not what we don't know, that at least oxytocin, vasopressin, and their receptors are part of this tuning system, part of the tuning form. Uh, Non-human mammal social monogamy is also associated with functional sex differences and these also create a lot of issues around general principles. I'd like to take the liberty of taking a quick backward view of this field because it will help you. So Lowell Getz, who has been mentioned several times, my colleague at the University of Illinois, uh, was studying both the prairie goals and the St. Patrick medicals. And he found there, he found they lived together in social bonds. Well, that, you see, it was what, at least 10 years of arguing with field biologists who claimed they weren't monogamous and a fellow named Don Dewsbury, I won't go into this either, but who argued that only monogamous mammals would only mate, uh, non-monogamous mammals would mate less than monogamous mammals. And unfortunately, he defined the end of mating as 30 minutes. And he, and once the, and the prairie goals are slow maters, not fast maters, slow not what Helen Fisher would say, so uh, they, he claimed they couldn't possibly be monogamous. So I had to go through 10 years of arguing with Don, which wasn't much fun, truly, because he's a very opinionated guy. And so finally, we kind of came out the other end of that with, between 1970 and 1980, dozens of experiments. I could never find any evidence in our studies that prairie voles preferred to have sex with one animal over another. They weren't very picky about that, but they were extremely picky about who they touched, who they sat by. Now, when I started doing this work, social behavior was the least respected possible kind of behavior you could study. Respectable scientists studied sex, or maternal behavior, or aggression. Oxy oh, social behavior is kind of the ether the non-seeing things that went on, the 99% of the time animals were not doing those other behaviors, but we had to argue for that too. It was not a, that each of these is what I would call little bits of uphill things that slow this down. In 1980, Eric, the father of the baby, was born, and I became obsessed with peptides, absolutely obsessed. And it was simply because I'm, I don't do drugs, I don't do doctors, I'm here today to prove you can live with all that, but I was given this oxytocin during the birth of my son, and given a choice, not real choice, between a C-section and extra oxytocin, I have spent the rest of the time since trying to figure out what it was. So if anybody asks you what keeps me in th this field, and why am I still here, <laughs> because I can't give up we still don't know, especially the development consequences. We did started, um, well, I, I had read the work of Ferris and Albers, which really, I feel, started the peptide field for me. But that was all about aggression. It showed that vasopressin increased territorial aggression in hamsters. I had worked with hamsters. Hamsters are the opposite extreme from prairie bulls. So I think it's really fortunate that I had started with the hamster because I wouldn't have realized how weird the prairie voles were. So I said yesterday, I spent most of my career looking at things that weren't there, looking for missing pieces in a story. Uh, Diane Witt was in my lab at the time, so you know Diane, because she used to work at NSF. She started, I wanted her to study pair bonding. She said, no, 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 I'm going to study sexual behavior. And I said, OK, fine. Um, don't be part of the, <laughs> the tsunami that's going to come in the next 30 years. 
And so she studied sex behavior. It, it actually did not facilitate sex behavior, but the animals spent, that were given oxytocin, spent more time in social contact. And I kept saying, Diane, Diane, that's so interesting. And she said, no, my experiment failed. So anyway, uh, we, she did also the first bowl oxytocin receptor on radiography. That also ran into trouble because we were working in Tom Ensel's lab at the time, and Tom looked at her data and said, you did it wrong. You must have done it wrong because we already know that uh, all species, peptides are conserved and all species are the same. This is a quote from him. And, I, and so she reran all the experiments, doubled the size, came out the same as being done in his lab, mind you, by basically uh, Al Johnson and Diane, Tom wasn't directly involved, but there was no way it was wrong. It was right, and then other people came, and Tom got very excited about it. He finally, could thank God. And he really takes a lot of credit, I think, for bringing people into this field because he's a fantastic salesman. And the receptor differences then, Larry Shapiro, who had worked with Dewsbury, brought the Montaigne Bowles with him to Tom's lab at NIH. I introduced him. And they began to study the comparison. So that was very exciting. Uh, Jesse Williams was working with me at the time. Jesse went on to become a clinician, a clinical <laughs> psychologist. But she is a very patient person, and she spent two years working out all the parameters of that pair bonding paradigm that you guys seem to like. I like it too. And it was very carefully thought out, you know, because people, sure, choice paradigms, that's nothing new. But what she did was give the animals three choices, one being a bone, always simultaneous choices, and there was no question these animals show very strong preferences, usually for a partner, and then we use that Oh, I have one more. Uh, Catania here. Some of you know Ken Catania. He won the Genius Awards, MacArthur Genius Awards. But he was helping us at the time in my lab. He was kind of in a, we'll call it a gap year. He was an undergraduate at the University of Maryland, stayed around. So good things happen to people, just so you know, guys, no matter where you go, good things happen to people that study prairie wolves first. <laughs> um, basic person facilitated bonding, we found which was Tom and Jim Winslow. Um, the vasopressin story came from, we had already set the paradigm up in my lab. Jim didn't believe it, so he redid it with six minute tests instead of five. Give me a break. And, I said, <laughs> and of course, there's no doubt that males that have made it become aggressive. And, and we were able to show that vasopressin, which I sort of figured it couldn't be oxytocin. Oxytocin just doesn't do that. Now we know now that there are some nuances here. But anyway, all of this went on to, we went on to show you, at least in our hands and also in Socians, that oxytocin and vasopressin were part of the selective sociality. General social behavior, non-selective behavior, either peptide worked, at least in Mary Cho, who was one of my master's students' experiments. And then, of course, molecular biology meets the prairie bowl. That's why we're here today. Um, Walt Disney had it right. It did all start with the mouse. Um, and of course, the prairie bowl is sometimes called the field mouse. And they have given us a fantastic opportunity. We think, based if we, I don't know if uh, Hans Hoffman's still around, but I wanted to show you his estimates. 10.5 million years ago is when Pennsylvanicus and Ocogaster, that version of monogamy, not monogamy, split off. It's a pretty long time. And um, we learned from the wonderful paper yesterday by Joanna that at least in Europe, and I'm sure we think in the US too, glaciers separated animals and that created the speciation. But what happened in that speciation is still for you guys to figure out. What is it that shifted? What is the secret sauce? I think oxytocin and vasopressin are part of it, but I'm not sure, I don't think we know, we can talk later, what really happened. Um, 
And Getz, of course, had done this wonderful field work 25 years. For any of you who are impatient, this is not the field to get into <laughs> uh, for a lot of good reasons. But he spent 25 years tracing the same animals in nature all year round. He would have to get a blowtorch to break the ice to get to the animals because they were awake and well but living under the ice in the winter in Illinois. Um, okay, what makes them interesting? They share with humans this high sociality, um, selective and enduring pair bonds, mate garden, uh, extended families, incest avoidance. That's one that I think is really interesting. And copulation that extends beyond fertility, outside of fertility. The metaphor which we were studying when we started with wool, because we could catch them, we had trouble growing, we had trouble breeding the Illinois metal bowl in the lab. They would attack each other. I think the female gets angry after she's made it. And if the only way people were really successful at getting them to mate, and I think Melinda and Zosha did this, they put them into very large containers, the metal bowls. Now the metal bowls that at least studies have been in the lab for a long time, right? They're, uh, you outbreed them? Okay, but you're breeding them from around where you live, which is Massachusetts. So I don't know if there's a difference between the ones that come from the Midwest or not. There's likely quite a lot of variation in the metal balls. But you see here, you already know, all these things are different, including one of the more interesting things is stranger direct aggression. I think we really need to understand that more, more fully. Uh, because the metaboles are, they're picky in finding a mate, but they aren't that picky about their social behavior. It's the prairie voles who are so selective. Uh, also, there are reduced sex differences. They're not huge in voles, but it's a pretty reliable pattern. So, uh, prairie voles, males and females, look a lot of alike if you've tried the sex of the bird. One of the more interesting, and this is an old finding from, I think, it, you know, I was trying to remember where we got montane blood, but glucocorticoids are dramatically different in uh, prairie voles and, in this case, montane voles. And we'll find out now at least we should te test this in your metaphor to be sure it's still true. Like, tenfold differences in total corticosterone. This is not unique to voles. This is also found in monogamous primates like common marmosets. And this work was actually done in George Cruz's lab, the assay with Courtney was doing them, and Susan Tamans. And we, we couldn't get this published either. People said, obviously, we've done it wrong. Everybody knows that corticosterone or cortisol, whichever, is going to be around 100 nanograms per ml, not hundreds, and certainly not, as someone showed here yesterday in the court, uh, 3,000. That We've seen those kinds of levels. The prairie has a huge cort, uh, adrenal cord, not prairie Yes, prairie voles have very large adrenals, actual adrenal weight's different. It's about twice to body weight ratio. And ACTH is different. This whole axis, now I'm still convinced, I don't know if any of you are studying this specifically, but I think this is part of the secret to how prairie voles become prairie voles. They are exposed to a lot of glucocorticoids during both early development and throughout the life cycle. So this is a piece of the puzzle that's not yet worked out, I don't think. Help me with this. So here are some of the features. And we see um, oxytocin being elevated and uh, associated with non-selective sociality, vasopressin with non-selective sociality, both needed for the truly selective behaviors. I assume that this is because of the relationship between vasopressin and dopamine and oxytocin and dopamine and this whole story which is starting to emerge. So I certainly encourage those of you who are working on this to continue. Um, now what's interesting is that the prairie looks like 
what oxytocin does, what we've discovered over and over again. Um, if it is associated with pair bonding, so I've kind of paralleled them here, showed you the uniqueness of base press in the center, um, you probably need both molecules for selective bonding in general. It's hard to eliminate one and the other. That's one of the challenges that I think you guys can solve with the molecular methods. Um, but your, so stranger directed aggression versus sociality is some kind of combined effect. And the sex differences, which are reduced in the prairie form, we don't really know the role of vasopressin <coughs> except possibly in the brain. And I'll show you what I uh, so we know that oxytocin has all kinds of behavioral effects, and we know that oxytocin is a very odd molecule, okay? Um, this also has gotten into infinite amounts of trouble because we tried to measure it. I never wanted to measure it. I was always trying to get somebody else to do it for me. Uh, and after we did measure it, we were told, oh, it's wrong. Okay, it's absolutely wrong. And I was working under the advice of someone named Larry Tamarkin who runs a whole company about uh, enzyme immunoassays. He tested the assay we were using. He said, no, this is perfectly good. And he tested it every possible way you can imagine. Larry had been at NIH and started his own company. Um, so I couldn't figure out why, you know, well, first everybody, people started extracting the molecule. Extraction, I have asked everybody I've ever worked with or know who did extractions, what they were extracting, they could never tell me. I said, that's not science. You can't just throw away 90% of a sample because someone told you to. And we couldn't do that because the prairie vault didn't have enough blood. Frankly, I would have probably gone with the crowd. But we couldn't do individual animals and use these assays that existed and so we didn't extract them. We finally written a paper, Evan McLean. Does anybody know Evan? I want you all to meet him. He's amazing. He studies dogs, are almost prairie bulls. Evan McLean is Paul McLean's grandson. And he came to me, he found me because he wanted to study dog oxytocin and he's done beautiful stuff. And we have a paper now which took over one year to get this silly little, I thought it was just going to be a commentary. It turned into a tour de force, and I had to bring out all the mass spec people I could get my hands on to prove what we already knew, which is that oxytocin sticks to everything, okay? And that's why when you extract it using the so-called standard procedures, which Enzo actually recommends in their kit, you are throwing it away because it's stuck to all the other elements in blood and probably everything. And why is it sticky? You all know the answer. This disulfide bond. So sulfur is the element that's essential to life on Earth. It's the unique element probably that explains why we're here today. But it also is incredibly, it's an incredibly active molecule. You recognize it in the sun, uh, scent of skunks or uh, other kinds of interesting things that smell a lot, because it's volatile too. Okay, so methods for measurement, nobody's wrong, everybody's methods work, but you're going to get different values depending on how you do them, and the outcome depends whether it's blood, brain, saliva, urine, I can, anybody that wants to talk about this common method, we can discuss it, because they are not the same, they shouldn't be the same, if once you realize things are sticking, once that oxytocin comes out of the pituitary and gets into the blood, it's immediately changing, instantly. So anybody that says, why isn't it the same as CSF? Well, CSF has a lot fewer elements for oxytocin to stick to. And saliva, ironically, we sort of invented this little salivary assay because I was interested in clinical work that was working in a medical school Actually, sal salivary oxytocin is the best for tracking change that we have at the moment. 
uh, urine this takes too long, you don't know when the urine, when the stuff made in the body got to the urine, so that's not so good. Blood is very complex, but blood gives you a lot of correlations. Basal blood levels give you a lot of lovely correlations, of behavior, physiological states, and pathology, so there's information involved. This is um, Steve Wilson, our collaborator in, in Oslo, who does the, has been helping us with the mass spec, and his wife's a graphic artist. So this argument, which as I say, I hope it's over, it's probably not, uh, about how the measure oxytocin, we describe it as the blind man and the elephant. So everybody sees what they look at, right? Now, oxytocin also has caused me a lot of trouble because it didn't do what I wanted it to. I wanted it to only be associated with good things, and everybody else wanted it to be associated with good things. But as soon as they did the experiments, uh, sure enough, depending on context, I believe, and the sense of safety, anxiety, other things, it can, I'm just guessing this cross line is my guess of what's going on, that under certain conditions, it's binding to the vasopressin receptor. And I think the vasopressin receptor, which is of course the older one, is particularly tuned to deal with fear, anxiety, life-saving events. Oxytocin, in my mind, I don't know if it's true, is a layer put on in the mammalian evolution that allows us to have this hypersociality that got us all into this world, right? So of course the molecules are very, very similar. We know if we can believe these sorts of data from when things first appeared, think they first appeared, that they both evolved from basotocin, but basopressin at about 100 mil million years earlier, so we and Larry have a beautiful science paper that summed this up back in 2008. Asher, how's, how's he said that Frenchman's name? Akher. Anyway, the first guy who did this work was a um, very interesting person who started looking at Asher. Asher. Uh, yeah. Anyway. This story is old, but it's very, still very new. Okay, so now we have these different, we have not just oxytocin in the center of the story, we have to put vasopressin there. I would far prefer we didn't. <laughs> it is really a pain, as you all know, because as long as you're sailing along, studying one thing at a time, you can be a linear thinker, you can have beautiful data, and then people will say, oh, but it doesn't agree with my data, and you have to stand back then and start to rethink it, and that's always going to be the place, place we go with oxytocin, because it's part of the system. It doesn't act like by itself. It does all those things that Dutch earlier blamed it on um, with vasopressin as a partner. Um, especially vasopressin is really good for saving your eye for offensive behaviors, protective aggression, and of course has several receptors, but the V1A, the one we know best, it seems to be involved in some of these forms of aggression. And it also plays a role, vasopressin is such an interesting molecule because it plays a role in other things like inflammation. Oxytocin is mainly anti-inflammatory, vasopressin mainly pro-inflammatory, and there are exceptions. So this is not a simple story. People ask me what oxytocin is good for. I say, well, I think it's the stress coping molecule. That way I don't have to figure out the, <laughs> the nuances here. It certainly, as Soshin and Adam and various people have shown, it's part of a mechanism that allows us to buffer and perhaps again to be mammals, to buffer against stress, to buffer against inflammation. Um, and, but there's a high level of oxytocin uh, group in Italy, Bicicchini, Bicicchini, I'm probably not saying her first name right, have beautiful studies showing that oxytocin and vasopressin are interacting across the lifespan. So it's, that's, they're part of the system, they're in a dynamic dance with each other, they're facilitating oxytocin, helping us to approach 
vasopressin also possibly increasing approach, but doing it most likely in a bit different way. I think vasopressin is more associated with bravery and sort of a male version, part of stereotype, of approach behaviors, but that still needs to be used. And it may just be that vasopressin is so much more primitive that it manages things like extreme stress and trauma as well. And I, again, my personal theory is that trauma and a lot of the things that are called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, look like vasopressin in action. Anxiety, sleep disorders, and so forth. Oxytocin allows us to shift out of those. It allows us to heal more effectively. It's a more modern way of doing business, and it's more likely to be dominant if we feel safe. It's hard to trick the body into feeling safe. Okay? Oxytocin, to some extent, does that. Of course, there are very slight structural differences between oxytocin and vasopressin. I don't think I'll go through this because I want to get to the origins of these molecules. This beautiful picture was loaned to me by Herr de Vries. And it was when I saw this, this is that, whoops, it changed itself, that rat brain that he has drawn so beautifully. And he had to give culture scene, by the way, which you may know, to get this kind of dramatic difference. But the male brain, especially in lateral septum, is loaded with vasopressin. And in my, again, way of trying to simplify this, I think that the lateral, this medial amygdala, bed nucleus, lateral septum axis, is the essence of the male to female differences. Um, Alexa Benhamut's done some beautiful studies showing also the vasopressin immunoreactivity is higher in males. This, these are tedious studies and they're quantitative, quite lovely. Um, this is an old paper from Larry and Tom. And I, what I found, or an old slide, and what I found interesting was right there in 2000, you could see, looking at brain areas that were hot with the oxytocin receptor, does this represent the way we see it now? And face press and you see that prefrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens receptors are there in the prairie fold, much less so in the mountain. Um, and then for the vasopressin receptors, that nucleus, lateral receptor, and so forth. So we're kind of, it's kind of just there in that one slide, I think, part of the story. Um, but again, we've got this dancing back and forth between these two peptides, which happens instantly. We've also got the fact that I um, now believe we can say with confidence that this system is turned by tuned by early life and early life adversity, but also positive behaviors nurture. Oxytocin, it, it's reestabbing this system, especially immediately after birth. Um, so now, why are socially monogamous now so different? Okay, we know what the differences are, but where are they coming from? The differences are the behaviors that we've talked about for two days, social tolerance, higher levels of oxytocin, or we measure them, that's how I started trying to do this. Distributions of receptors, of course, and then this capacity to be epigenetically tuned. I think that's critical. And I think the people doing the epigenetic work are right on the task. And we, of course, are working with Jess Conley, and I'll talk about that real quick. Um, also, there was a very peculiar finding we found only because my husband studies the autonomic nervous system, and he's been pretty vehement in explaining to me that you know everything has to be affected by the autonomic nervous system. And now most people believe that, so this is a whole field. The whole study of Vegas is very big in clinical work and manipulations of it. But the prairie bull had a human-like parasympathetic tone. We did this first with uh, Angela Grippel when she was a postdoc with us. And um, it's almost unbelievable that they're using this system the way a human does to calm the sympathetics, to control that system. This is prairie bulls. Also, I think what happened, and I've written all this out in a paper I published last year, 
I think what has happened is that in the socially monogamous species, there's been some kind of shift from mostly steroid-based determinations of things like aggression over to testosterone and dihydro and or dihydro away from those molecules and toward the peptides. And maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the peptides are more ancient and the steroids are added in on top. I don't know what I can't. People who, excuse me, who are experts tell me that this, the peptides, they think the peptides are older. I'm not an expert, but it's if they are, then maybe these steroid sex differences, which are relatively diminished in the social and monogamous mammals, are more modern. Um, just comments I mentioned, Alison Perkabile, Will, who's here, Jason E. Craig Ferris, and I put in a good deal of time developing new methodologies. I'm just going to tell you what some of them are, not trying to talk about the data. And we'll have a poster on one of the studies, and they're all published now, with mostly within the last year. So early life exper experiences, including differential parenting, and or exposure to oxytocin epigenetically tune the oxytocin system, the receptor, the oxytocin receptor. And I think what they're doing here, I think our early life experience and oxytocin are pretty much doing the same thing if they're in optimal doses, okay? You can overstimulate animals. We've done some sort of handling studies that Karen Bale started with us meant to be controls. <laughs> and it turned out that if we didn't handle the bulls at all, or if we handled them three times, we never actually published them three times, both interfered with pair bonding for life. They need a certain amount of stimulation, and it looks like it basically it's what you might call good mothering in the first few days of life for this system to work. Oxytocin receptor, you all know very well, it's a standard kind of model of a, of a G-coupled protein. The downstream subcellular piece of this is going to turn out to be really important to all of these oxytocin and these present differences. People working on cancer are finding that already. It's a really burgeoning field of, of study because you can't have that one receptor doing everything without some kind of lower levels of specificity. But the good news is it can be tuned, as I mentioned, and we all know. So we have a system that allows the individual to have experiences that ch then change it for life. These are the experiences that allow oxytocin to act like oxytocin. They may also allow oxytocin to act on the vasopressin receptor. So there's a whole developmental field waiting for somebody to jump in and do the molecular work. Um, the Prairie Vol is a wonderful model, and you guys have set up this fabulous new findings. Jess approached me about 10 years ago, Jess Conley, who is trained originally as a yeast biologist, sort of wanted to study Prairie voles. She also works on humans. She developed a kind of marker approach. It's turned out to be very effective in humans for sort of screening differential sensitivity to oxytocin, even FMRI can change, high levels of methylation, and she's also studying hydroxymethylation. So there's a, obviously there's a flip side to this story that needs to be discovered. Um, one of the more interesting things about this is that a single postnatal experience has lifelong consequences. Jess picked out three CPG sites, she did this in some kind of old-fashioned genetic way where she studied all the sequences and figured out which ones would be most likely to affect the expression of the receptor. I keep asking her, I said, how'd you do this? There's so much. She said, ah, oh, it's easy. Uh, but what she found was that the prairie vole, no shock here, right? Prairie vole has a human-like uh, regulation of that system that mice and rats don't. There's site conservation in the areas that she picked out. One site in mice, none in rats. <coughs> One more point for why prairie voles are superior. They're human-like. 
in how they tune their, uh, their genetics or epigenetics and expression of the receptor. They probably predict, we've got tons of data from Jess and her husband, uh, Jamie Moore, is showing predictions of these epigenetic markers for just about everything. Autism, brain activation, postpartum depression, um, and so forth. And uh, oxytocin methylation is cre increased by oxytocin expression, exposure in females, but not in males. Females may be advantaged this way. And this may be one of the reasons males and females are different in general. I don't think, I don't know what time it is, do you this? Running out of time. Uh, pardon? 11.50. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I get a few more minutes. Because uh, I was talking really fast, so I gave you an hour talk. Um, so one of the experiments which we've just published in psychoneuroendocrinology that Alison Perkabal took the lead on and Will was involved with involves looking at differential early experience, a handling paradigm, the one I mentioned that Karen sort of found by accident, uh, that if we did not stimulate the animals, we also did not get these changes in methylation. Um, the early handling led to differences at the CPG, two different brain CPG sites and two different brain regions. Handling increases parental response to the baby. Probably this whole thing is mediated by mom. That reduced methylation and increased oxytocin receptor. Now how could it reduce methylation? Well, normally methylation is increasing at birth, and there's a de novo increase, at least, in prairie voles. We've shown it here from animals taken embryonically at, post at embryonic day 21 and compared to postnatal day 24. And you can see in the unhandled animals, the methylation is going up. The methylation, in this case, in the handled animals, it doesn't go down, it just doesn't go up. So this early parental care prevents what they call de novo methylation, prevents the silencing of the oxytocin gene. I'm sure there's a lot more to this story. Uh, but it's very fascinating. These differences were seen after birth. Uh, these differences are associated with a whole suite of different kinds of behavior. So naturally occurring variation, what Allison's done is look at individual variation. And as you might expect, the super good moms, healthy super good, not helicopter moms, <laughs> are actually having more benefits and different methylation later. Uh, Will, has, this is a slide from Will talking about the other thing that I'm most passionate about that got me into this field, which are development interventions, birth interventions. And he and I have been partners on this now for well over 10 years. So long it's embarrassing. <laughs> but I'm afraid he shares my absolute obsession with figuring this out. Look what we're doing. We're giving one out of every three mothers a surgical intervention that is not just a C-section, it's, it's analgesia, opioids to be frank. It's um, stress of birth, change, totally. You need to be born. We now know that the elective C is about the worst thing you can do. And why is that? Is it because there's not sufficient amount of actually oxytocin prime system? It may turn out, sort of ironically, that induction of labor in a C-section setting is actually good. There's always too much, too little, so you've got to figure out at a clinical level what's right. We don't know that. But in these data that Will shows, the induction rate, uh, the C-section rate, which is really it's much higher in some areas like Brazil than here, but uh, it's still one in three. One in three. When my kids were born, it was one in 10, okay? So that's now 40, 30 years ago. Something dramatically is happening. 
And that dramatic thing is a combination of all of these bits and pieces that we're studying, including not just oxytocin, but as I mentioned, the use of opioids. I'm very concerned because I have not seen any evidence to the contrary that we may be priming an entire generation of people if you believe that naive opioid use is different from having a history of opioids than being exposed to opioids on your first day of life. What's that doing? Somebody please get busy and study this because this is an ongoing massive human experiment. Massive. Um, Will and um, several other students, Lisa Erickson, people in the lab, spent years working out a model for birth. So we could find out and do. Lisa was a midwife who came to me also to work on these problems. She's since got a PhD in nursing and still working on the humans because we don't know what we're doing. We're just experimenting on people. I, I, I find this amazing. No one's even saying, hey, wait, you mean it matters? Well, it does matter. Maybe it's good. I hope some of these things are good. I'm trying to be optimistic. Uh, <laughs> but we're messing with Mother Nature, literally. Okay. Uh, we found early on in Karen's studies, and there's an author on this back, and Miranda helped us, uh, to set up um, the autoradiography, sort of quantify it. And Karen compared animals that were exposed to oxytocin and those that were not. And what happened didn't, in this study didn't change the oxytocin receptor in what we could see. It probably did, but we didn't have sex and measure. Vasopressin was diminished. The receptor went down. According to my simple-minded model, that's good for making a prairie bowl in a sense. Okay. But it also increased it in one area. So when we got these data, it turns out that ventral pallidum, the oxytocin-treated animals, had more uh, vasopressin receptor. And I remember telling Larry, you're going to be happy when you see these data. <laughs> because we, that was when he was working on the ventral pallidum pair bonding. So it probably is a kind of good thing to have a little extra oxytocin. Higher doses, that's another question altogether. Will has developed these amazing analytic methods. He's such a fantastic person, really. You guys should all get to know him. But what he found here, if you can see this, uh, this is a method for comparing the effects of oxytocin at the time of birth. This is published this year in Science Advances. They changed the oxytocin and the receptor and the vasopressin receptor in adulthood. Remember, we're talking about one exposure in early life. And what you find, if you look at the red, you see those are increased oxytocin receptors in the male, not in the female, right? Well, I don't want to show that. So, and the vasopressin receptors actually went down, just as they did in Karen's autoradiography study in the old paper, okay? And as I say, the females, if anything, showed a slight decrease after extra oxytocin. Probably that's very dose dependent. Um, but we also, we've developed, as we heard here, and we've got to get on Craig's case and get him to make it public, out of um, Atlas that Craig himself developed. Craig's a really super anatomist. I wouldn't trust anybody else that I know to do all of these areas and be sure they were in the right place. Um, and he used multiple animals. He explained to me that the usual atlas is made like a mouse rat atlas is where they small one animal. <laughs> okay. Now this is five or six, but it's still a great improvement. Uh, and it's available we it should have been online. I don't know. I don't I am paying enough attention. I can see Jason was working with them at the time. They also, with Will's help, got the uh, live animal imaging to work, and all of that's published. And there'll be more. So if you've got a magnet and you want to do some fMRI in animals, all the pieces are now in place to do that. And Will knows how to do it. Jason, unfortunately, left the country and went to Austria. Uh, 
Ball, not mommy. And so, <laughs> so we've got one piece of the team still here that knows how to do this work. It's hard. It's hard. Because animals don't like being stuck in the back. So the early life experiences epigenetically act to change the animal. The nurturing changes it. Extra oxytocin changes it. Water doses may not be so bad. High doses, we just don't know. More is not always better, and possibly that's because of vasopressin being part of the system. Males seem to be especially sensitive. Every experiment is always the males. There's a disruptive effect. I assume that's vasopressin also based on the fact that males are using a more complex cocktail. The males are sore to mature than females, as you know from the work of Benari, probably there's a protective GABA effect in early life. That's, that's regulated by oxytocin. So again, that's another story that could impact on humans and needs to be better understood. What are the lessons from prairie voles? There are so many, I can't go into them. The one I think I'd like to encourage people to work on is the fact that prairie voles aren't sexually dimorphic, like they ought to be, okay? You ought to be able to look at a male and a female and tell them apart. Well, if you've got good eyes on the first day of life, you can probably sex them. But after that, it starts to get harder. You really have to know what you're doing. Um, and that's, I think, because they're insensitive to androgens. Why do I think that? Because Joe Onstein gave extra androgens. We did, actually, we did this first. Years ago, when D.C. Roberts said, we couldn't get any effect. So why aren't they showing changes? We're shooting them up with a huge amount of testosterone. Well, the answer, I think, is obvious. They aren't sensitive to it. They have a lot, if you measure, Joe measured, the testosterone levels, they're not low levels, they're high. Uh, there's some kind of insensitivity that's reducing the functional effects of androgens. I'd be willing to bet that that extends to other monogamy, non-monogamy pairings, and that when we really understand this story, we're going to find that there are some very interesting, let's get that one, there are some very interesting things going on in the androgen, vasopressin, oxytocin interactions that explain first monogamy in general, the ability to switch to a peptide way of doing life versus androgens, because internally the prairie voles are quite masculine. They have plenty of sperm. They, it's not a disruption of their capacity to be reproductive males, but the physiological effects of that are different. So either the receptor's not working, or the conversion, uh, I've written all this out the paper, the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, the famous alpha reductase pathway may be changed. There are, I found evidence in the literature there are a thousand known mutations in the testosterone gene in humans. A thousand. So I imagine that you could see a way in which, and this could happen more than once than looking at Joanna, uh, this could be something that happens under different conditions and may be a piece of this pathway that leads us to so called monopoly. But it's got to have a steroid piece in it. I went through, I'm not going to show you this except to say that these are my targets. Uh, androgen itself could be different, but it doesn't seem to be low. Um, androgen, if you're following the wonderful, wonderful work of Peggy McCarthy, you know that our idea of what causes sex differences has taken an abrupt change based on Peggy's work. And I think it, it seems that estrogen is the critical element. We already knew that. But what we didn't realize is that it's an inflammatory pathway. And so this could be where oxytocin comes in again. So oxytocin could be preventing sexual differentiation in part by turning down the inflammatory processes. 
all testable, all testable with methods that you guys have got your hands on, and all pretty contemporary questions, just not in the field yet, as far as I know. So that's the end of my story. Um, what do we know? It's a pretty cool animal. It's worth your time. Thank you. Time for one or two questions, but then we want to go ahead and go on to the to the final discussion. Stunned. Because <laughs> you are you do everything I said. We don't have questions. I am very happy to talk to people. I'm here this afternoon, and I'd love to talk to you about anything. I say everything I've said is published at this point. <laughs>